This short video will guide you through the proper troubleshooting procedure for a refrigerant leak in the residential air conditioning simulator. I will also discuss proper charging procedures in this video. Begin by clicking the start button on the phone. Next, let's proceed to the thermostat by clicking the icon at the bottom left of the page. Once at the thermostat, click the selector switch to the cool position. This will also turn down the temperature setting of the thermostat. Our next step is to take a brief inventory of which electrical loads are running. We're going to begin at the indoor unit. Click the indoor unit icon at the bottom of the page. As we can hear, the indoor fan motor or indoor blower is operating. For further verification of this, remove the side panel and observe the graphic indicating that in fact the blower is turning. Next, we need to go to the outdoor unit to verify that the compressor and condenser fan are running. Click on the outdoor unit icon. Once at the outdoor unit, we can see that the condenser fan is running. We can also hear the compressor operating. If you like, open the control box and click on the clamp on ammeter. This will allow you to verify that the compressor is in fact operating. And we can see we do have a current draw here of 11 amps. We're going to put the clamp on ammeter away now that we've verified that the compressor and condenser fan are operating. With all electrical loads operational, this means that we have a mechanical problem. Our next step is to check refrigerant pressures and superheat. Begin by taking the gauge manifold out of the toolbox. Place the red hose on the high pressure liquid line connection. And we can see we have approximately 212 PSIG. Now, the high side pressure should correspond to a temperature approximately 20 degrees above the outdoor temperature. If we click on the toolbox again and take out the outdoor thermometer, we'll move the gauges out of the way for the time being, we can see that it's 95 degrees outside. This means that under normal operating conditions, the refrigerant should be condensing in the condenser at approximately 115 degrees. Let's take a look at the temperature pressure chart. We're going to store the thermometer away for now and move the gauges over to the side. This icon here on the right will open the temperature pressure chart. If we follow the 212 PSIG, and we can see we've got approximately 210.8, which is fairly close, we can see that the refrigerant is condensing at 105 degrees. In fact, only 10 degrees above the outdoor temperature. This is a lower than normal high side pressure on the air conditioner. We're going to store the chart away and we're going to place the blue hose on the suction line connection on the low side of the system. And here we can see we have 50 PSIG of suction pressure. Again if we go back to the temperature pressure chart, 50 PSI of suction pressure is only a 26 degree evaporator. At no time under normal operating conditions should an air conditioner be operating below freezing. This can cause condensation that forms on the coil to freeze to the surface of the coil. Our next step is to measure superheat. Superheat is the amount of temperature picked up by the refrigerant vapor after it has fully vaporized in the evaporator. We're going to take out our multimeter. We'll store the gauges away for now take out the multimeter and turn it to temperature and place the clamp on the suction line. We can see that the temperature of the suction line is 75 degrees. This is a fairly serious issue in that most compressors of this nature are cooled by the suction vapors. Suction temperatures in excess of 65 degrees Fahrenheit will result in inadequate motor cooling and overheating of the compressor. I'm going to take the gauges back out of the toolbox again and place the low pressure hose or blue hose on the suction service connection. Now we can see that we have 75 degrees Fahrenheit and a 26 degree evaporator temperature based on the 50 PSIG on the temperature pressure chart. 
If we look at the difference in these two numbers, we can see that we have 49 degrees of superheat, which is very excessive. This most likely indicates an undercharge or a leak in the system. Our next step is to determine what the target or proper superheat should be on this system. I'm going to begin by putting the meter and the gauges back in the toolbox. And I'm going to take out the digital psychrometer. I'm going to start by clicking the dry bulb temperature and measuring the outdoor temperature or the temperature of the air entering the condenser, which again we can see is 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, we're going to proceed to the indoor unit and again remove the digital psychrometer from the toolbox. Place it in the glowing hotspot in the return air back to the indoor unit. Click the wet bulb selector. The wet bulb temperature measures the latent or dehumidification portion of the heat load on the air conditioning unit. Here we can see that we have 70 degrees wet bulb temperature. Placing the thermometer back in the toolbox, we're going to click on this right tab again. At the bottom of the temperature pressure chart, click superheat. This provides us with the superheat charging chart, which will help us verify and correct the charge. If we look at the two numbers, 95 degree outdoor temperature and 70 degree wet bulb, we can see that these intersect at 18 degrees of superheat. This means that if the unit is charged properly, we will have 18 degrees of measured superheat. Just a note, any measured superheat within plus or minus 5 degrees of the target, in this case 18, is acceptable, meaning that anything from 13 to 23 degrees of measured superheat would be okay. We already know that we have 49 degrees of superheat, which is very excessive. This indicates again that we have an undercharge or a leak in the system. Let's go back out to the outdoor unit and do some leak testing. Prior to using the leak detector, Make some visual inspections. One thing you can do is look for traces of oil around mechanical fittings and joints. This usually indicates the presence of a refrigerant leak as the refrigerant oil will not evaporate as does the refrigerant. Now that we've determined there are no obvious signs of a leak, we need to look a little bit closer. Begin by removing the refrigerant leak detector from the toolbox. This detector will pick up the presence of refrigerant leaking from the system. Move the detector along all mechanical joints and fittings very slowly. When a leak is present, there will be an audible and a visual alarm on the leak detector. So here we move along the lines, paying close attention to fittings at both the indoor and outdoor coil, as well as around the filter dryer. And here we can see we have a leak located, indicated by the red marker here. And we can see the detector alarm go off. Both the green indicator light as well as the audible alarm are obvious here. Our next step is to store the leak detector. Click on the location of the leak and repair. But wait, before repairing any leaks, refrigerant must be recovered from the system. Under no circumstances should you solder, braze, or weld on any system with refrigerant in it. After the refrigerant has been recovered, the refrigerant leak can be repaired by clicking on the leak location and clicking Fix Leak. Now the leak has been fixed. Our next step would be to properly evacuate and dehydrate the system, piping, and coils prior to adding refrigerant back into the system. Be sure to use micron gauges and evacuate and dehydrate to 500 microns minimum. Under EPA regulations, systems should not simply be topped off with refrigerant. Leaks should always be repaired. To add refrigerant back to the system, take out the gauge manifold from the toolbox, attach the hoses to the system, And next, 
click on the refrigerant cylinder located right here with the plus sign on it. And here we can see we've charged the system. To determine how much refrigerant to add, again, measure the superheat. And when you're within five degrees, plus or minus, of the target, the charge is correct. Let's take a look. We now have 70 PSIG of suction pressure. In taking out the temperature pressure chart, we can see that 70 PSIG gives us a 41 degree evaporator temperature. Our next step is to measure the temperature of the suction line again. Take the multimeter out of the toolbox, turn it to temperature, and place the clamp probe on the suction line glowing hotspot. Again, you may need to zoom in to catch the hotspot. This time, I'm going to use the digital gauge manifold. The digital gauge manifold, although expensive, can provide us with automatic temperature to pressure conversions without the use of a temperature pressure chart. We're going to take the blue hose and place it on the suction service port, and we can see we have 70 PSIG here displayed on the gauge. This converts to a 40 degree evaporating temperature with R22 refrigerant. Our next step is to measure the temperature of the vapors on the suction line. Take the multimeter out of the toolbox and turn it to temperature. At this point, click on the clamp probe and place it on the glowing hotspot on the suction line. Here we can see we are measuring 53 degree vapor on the suction line. This means that with a 40 degree evaporating temperature and a 53 degree suction line temperature, we have 13 degrees of superheat, which is within plus or minus 5 degrees of our previous target of 18 degrees, meaning that the system is now correctly charged and will operate efficiently. Just one more important note. The superheat charging method should only be used on systems with fixed bore metering devices. Air conditioning systems and heat pumps with thermostatic expansion valve metering devices use the subcooling charging method. We will discuss that a little bit more later on in the commercial AC simulator. Don't forget to go back inside, replace all caps and covers, and click on the broom to clean the work area. Good luck.